Russ Salakunitov uh, was a professor at U of T, was part of the Creative Destruction Lab, and is now a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, um, uh, an absolute leader in the field of artificial intelligence. He has this small side gig uh, where he runs uh, AI for Apple. That also, he has that small side gig. Uh, and uh, Steve Lohr from the New York Times is up here today. Take it away, gentlemen. Um, uh, thank you. Um, Russ is here to basically uh, sort of set the scientific table for the day. Um, and he's got a presentation, uh, and it's, it's got, uh, he's going to show it how it actually works, including some videos, I gather. So yes. this, is, this is, you know, where the technology, the progress it has been, has made, what's its trajectory, and what are the challenges. So with, in less than 20 minutes, Russ, take it away. No, yes, I'll try, to be, I'll try to be very quick to keep us on time. Thanks, thanks by the way, to, uh, uh, to AJ and Shimon for organizing this conference. What I'd like to do is I'd like to tell you uh, a little bit about some of the recent advances and some of the key challenges. So the impact of deep learning has been quite tremendous, and that came as a surprise to a lot of us as well working in that area. Uh, speech recognition, computer vision, recommender systems, language understanding is something I'll say a few words about. Drug discovery, medical image analysis, and health is something that's going to be transformed uh, in the near future. Um, some of the key challenges that a lot of us in scientific communities uh, are working on is this three bullet points that I've list, I'm listing here. One is reasoning attention and memory. How can we develop systems that can reason, not just do pattern recognition, which is what's happening a lot today. Language understanding is another big area, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. Reinforcement learning, as well as unsupervised learning, one-shot learning, and transfer learning. There's a few concepts that I'll try to uh, elaborate just a little bit on. Um, let me show you a couple of examples. This is sort of a success story. Um, these systems were developed in the last couple of years. So I give you an image. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to build an AI system that can generate a caption. Um, and if you look at these captions, these are pretty remarkable, uh, right? And that's, to many of us in the vision field, that's a holy grail of computer vision. Getting a system that can tell a story about the image, not just say there's a dog in the image or there's a cat in the image. Uh, but then, you know, you also get these examples, uh, just to show you. I particularly like the second one. So you can see it says the handlebars are trying to ride a bike rack. Um, now, why am I showing it to you? Actually, to us, it was very exciting. And the reason why is because that means that these systems are able to generate something that, that's different from what humans are generating, even though it doesn't make much sense. And sometimes you get these kinds of uh, uh, examples. <laughs> And the reason for that is, again, it's a core problem in machine learning in general is that if I show you uh, the, uh, uh, the systems were not trained on, on uh, images of sports, uh, but uh, you know, that's, that's what you get. Uh, let me show you one other example is this notion of building systems that can reason. Imagine I show you this, uh, uh, this particular document. This is uh, coming from CNN News Story about the rest of the Illinois government, Rob Blagojevich. I don't know if you remember back in 2008, there was this... Uh, uh, scandalous uh, uh, story about corruption uh, charges of, of Rob Blagojevich trying to sell Obama's uh, Senate seat. Imagine I give you a query of the form, President-elect Barack Obama said on Tuesday he was not aware of alleged corruption by X and so forth. And the question is, who is X? And people can solve these problems very easily, right? And the right answer is Rob Blagojevich. But for machines, it's very difficult because that requires you to go through the whole document and try to understand what, what are we talking about and what's the question uh, uh, is asking. And what we've seen in the last couple of years is evolution of these very complex systems. These are multi-layer systems. They have something that's called recurrent networks, deep networks. And, and so you can see that people are trying to come up with the more and more sophisticated systems that can actually try to reason and not just do pattern recognition. Um, and in particular, what's interesting about those uh, uh, systems is that in this particular case, the model is able to figure out that Alleged corruption and Senate seat are the two key components that I need to pick up from the document in order to be able to answer the question. This is not provided by humans. That's a system learning on its own. What is it important that I need to pick up in order to be able to answer that question? Um, the last thing, uh, just a couple of minutes, I'd like to uh, show you a couple of examples of, of this idea of reinforcement learning, or learning behaviors, where I get an observation and I try to get an action. Uh, and we've seen a lot of success stories. AlphaGo, for example, is one success uh, a story of, of, of these kinds of systems. Um, what, um, uh, one of the things, one of the big innovations in the last couple of years that came out uh, in our field is, is this notion of learning memory. 
or try to equip our AI with, with memory mechanisms so that we can store important information, we can retrieve important information. It's beautiful work that was done by Alex Grave uh, at, at DeepMind. Um, let me just show you one particular example of why this is a hard problem. Imagine that I give you a very simple random maze, and, and the rules of the games are, if I see the indicator, it's something that I would call an indicator. If the indicator is blue, um, I have to find the green block. If the indicator is pink, I have to find the red block. Now, this is a very simple problem, but it turns out to be very difficult for machines because I have to remember the state of the indicator and to navigate in this random environment to figure out what the right target is. So here's an example of what these systems can do. Uh, the indicator is, uh, is blue, so the system goes to the wrong target. It remembers um, that it's the wrong target, it backtracks, and tries to find uh, uh, the correct target. And there's a memory mechanism that the model is learning what to write in the memory, how to read from the memory, so that in this random environment, it can actually you know, find, find the right target. And um, Ultimately, we want to be able to build systems, systems that have this external memory mechanism, systems that have knowledge base, systems that can reason and communicate and remember uh, important information to store so that you can you know, uh, uh, act optimally in, in the future. One last thing I wanted to show you is this example that was done at, at CMU on uh, trying to learn to execute instructions. So here I'm showing you uh, a system that says, you know, go to the, go to the red pillar. And the, and the agent has to figure out what does it mean, the red pillar, or go to the short torch. It has to understand what's the meaning of the word short uh, without us specifying what that is. And as the system learns in this virtual environment, eventually it starts figuring out things like what's the meaning of the word tallest, or what's the meaning of the word shortest, um, or what's the meaning of the word red or red tall and, and such. So these are little baby steps, uh, uh, but at the same time, you know, so he goes to the largest object, for example. These are baby steps, and after about 72 hours of training, you can handle occlusions, you can figure out, you know, how you should be acting in the environment, and you can really ground some of these, uh, some of these concepts. Um, one final piece that I want to say is uh, one of the big challenges for a lot of what we're trying to do is how can we develop systems that can learn from fewer examples or they can learn from fewer experiences. Right now, when we train these systems in virtual environments, we can simulate millions of environments, billions of environments, uh, right? So how can we actually do it in the real world? It's still it's, it's, it's a very uh, open question, and it's, you know, uh, I see a lot of research done, uh, done in that space. And thank you. Thanks, Russ. But there's been a lot of attention uh, recently in the last few weeks to uh, AlphaGo Zero, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know about it, it's the, uh, uh, it's the DeepMind program, DeepMind, which is acquired by Google, uh, that has actually, it, that it came up with the original AlphaGo project, which, uh, which beat the best Go player, human Go players in the world. But AlphaGo is able to do, the, AlphaGo Zero is able to do this apparently without a lot of you know, uh, try, you know, showing it a lot of games, a lot of tagged information. And this is this sort of this unsupervised learning that people talk about, or so it seems. But it's in a very, it's in a, still in a mathematically bounded world. It is not learning as in the field people talk about, learning as, you know, a child learns to walk. You know, or uh, the classic example is used is of it, show you a video, there's the water glass at the edge of the picnic table, what happens next? Well, w humans know that it's likely to fall, the water spills. Um, it's hard for computers. I mean, put that AlphaGo Zero uh, achievement in perspective. Yes, I think that it's, it's, a, it's a really good uh, achievement. I, I was really impressed with what they were able to do. One remarkable thing about um, AlphaGo Zero is that it can learn to play Go uh, just from doing self-play. So there is no human sort of uh, uh, involved, right? You're just, you're just creating self-play, so the agent place against, against itself many, many times, and you can basically surpass human level performance, which I think was, was, was a, a really impressive achievement. Um, one thing that I'd like to point out is that in the game of Go, uh, uh, here you basically have uh, a fully, what, what sometimes people call fully observed environment, right? You can see the state of the entire game, um, uh, and so this, is, this makes the problem a little bit easier. Um, 
there's a lot of work now happening in the space of, of how can we build these kinds of environments, but in partially observable uh, uh, environments where you don't actually get to see the entire state. Um, uh, much like what you've seen in you know, examples like Doom, for example, when you try to navigate, you don't really know where your opponents are, or you don't really have the full, uh, full information. Um, but this idea of self-plates, it's, it's an old one. Uh, I, I see Rich Sutton sort of pioneered some of, some of that work. So it's, it's, it's been around for a long time. But at the same time, I think it's a very, very impressive achievement. I, I know that um, there also was wonderful post done by OpenAI on the game of uh, uh, Dato, which is a sports game, uh, and they were able to show that also by doing self-play, you can achieve ex very impressive results. Uh, so I think that's, that's to, to me, it's, it's a really good advance going forward. At the same time, it comes back to one of the points that I was mentioning is that when we're working in a simulation world, because we can simulate the board game, we can simulate uh, the, uh, the, the, the video games, and, and what's happening really is that you, you, you're building billions of simulations, so you're trying to analyze as much as possible. And, and one key question again remains, how do you take that and put it in, in some real world application? Uh, so that that's still is, is, is an open question. Um, thanks, Russ. Um, uh, let me uh, play AJ's uh, time game, the obligatory time game that, we've, uh, uh, that is the theme of the conference. Um, uh, yeah, uh, obviously, uh, in terms of trade here, you can't talk about anything you're doing at Apple. Um, but um, you, you know, what we have seen is these real advances in capabilities, image recognition, speech recognition, um, uh, you know, uh, language translation, for example. And people then build businesses on those capabilities. And those capabilities have really improved, you know, in the last five years, certainly, but more so than people thought, right? Um, speak to capabilities. I mean, wh what, um, what kinds of capabilities, you know, do you see happening? First take the next two years, then five. And, um, you know, not predictions, but what's your best bet about what we'll be, be able to do? And then maybe a hint of what we're not able to do. Yeah, so I think that... In the next couple of years, uh, um, it's, it's very hard to predict because, you know, uh, uh, sometimes you have these really great advances that are coming, you know, like Alpha, Alpha Go, for example, Alpha Go Zero that nobody, nobody expected. Um, I think that in the next couple of years, we'll see more and more uh, work done in the space of language understanding or building dialogue-based systems, building stronger and, and, and more intelligent personal assistants. Uh, being able to build systems, again, that can perhaps answer more complex questions or be able to uh, uh, maintain a dialogue. Uh, so that's something that I think is going to be happening in the next, in the next couple of years. Can, can I just interject on that one just a little bit? Um, um, on the agents, you know, Larry Smarr of uh, UC San Diego and was one of the supercomputer uh, heads uh, for the United States for years, uh, talked about, you know, where are we going per? The movie is Scarlett Johansson, yeah. Right. And 2025, it said it, 2025, right? right. Um, I think most, are, are, what are, or are you, and that has this whole human emotion thing, which Danny right. Ganneman can speak freely about because he doesn't know how hard it is to do, right? Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it, what, are, are we're likely to see verticals? In other words, vertical in, in specific domains, um, whether it's, you know, it's a conversational chatbot for legal or for some other. I mean, right. what in, in these next couple of years, what do you, as it's, it's, it's a practice? It's an interesting question. I, it's, it's hard to speculate, but I think that what we will start seeing is, is, is we're going to start seeing this, the, these verticals um, in the space. One, one example could be a, a, a medical domain, right, where I'm talking to like a personalized doctor. Uh, another domain that I think we'll see some examples in the next couple of years is, is you know, you go to uh, and ask some technical questions. Like, you know, my TV doesn't work. What do I do? Or in the case of, uh, um, uh, you know, you, you try to compile some code and you can't. And, and you try to ask somebody, how do I compile the code? And you're going to have a bot, an agent that looks at, uh, I don't know, Ubuntu manual and, and answers you how, how to proceed. So I think that in these very specific, perhaps technical domains, we're going to start seeing more and more um, these dialogue-based uh, dialogue based agents that uh, uh, my prediction is that within the next couple of years, we'll start seeing automation in that space. Uh, and in, in, as well as for big IT companies, a lot of work on, on you know, getting help and, and ordering things and, and such. 
And, and some genuine flexibility. Yeah, As opposed right. to, you know, today's chatbots are kind of voice recognition on, on, on top of FAQs, yeah, you know, yeah, frequently right. asked questions. Yeah, that's right. Or, or like templates. A lot of it right now is templates, right? Like I'm asking, you know, how do I buy this product? And, and then there's a template. Well, you go to this website and so, and so forth. The question is, can we build systems that can actually, you know, look more like humans and, and, and be able to kind of uh, 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 com communicate with you um, I also think that in the next uh, few years, we're also going to see some strong applications of reinforcement learning. Uh, I can't predict when they're going to be applied in the real world, but I think we're going to see in terms of algorithmic developments, we're going to see more and more algorithmic developments in, in reinforcement learning, just because there's so much interest and so many groups are looking at, uh, at, at that very important problem. And that might be able to let us do what? Well, any time you have a system that takes a perception, which is the world around you, understands you know, where the chairs are, uh, where the tables are, and takes an action so you can navigate in, in the environment, that's where we'll see uh, some advances. Of course, it's probably a little bit longer than two years, like, uh, but this is, this is the hope. That you're building autonomous, autonomous systems that can perceive, understand surroundings, and then execute uh, take an action and, and execute in this partially observed uncertain environments. One last question, and, and we'll uh, conform to time, if not better here. Um, again, you can't talk about anything you're doing at Apple, but uh, my, my, one of my questions when, when you joined was why Apple? I mean, as, you know, somebody with your set of skills, it's pretty much pick of the litter. You could have gone anywhere, right? And you're, you're going to retain an academic mooring uh, at Carnegie Mellon, which you've done. Um, and, you know, you joined a place that was famous for being closed, not publishing papers, you know, not, you know, not o opening up to the world. And this is, you know, this is in the academic world, this is how innovation progresses. And so what, you know, obviously there was a lure and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't money. You know, I mean, you know, you could have gotten it anyway, right? Um, what are the, you know, what makes Apple an interesting place to work other than, you know, building on, you know, Tom Gruber's work at Siri or something. But, you know, yeah. what, what was the nexus that really got you? Right, right. Well, that's a, that's a very good question. Let me see how I, how I answer that question. Um, so one thing, maybe I can just say a few, uh, a few things. One thing that really drew me to, to uh, Apple is the fact that it's a very dynamic place. And there are a lot of smart people once you actually get to talk to uh, uh, those folks. And then the other thing that really attracted me to Apple are, are the problems that they're trying to solve. So the problems that they're trying to solve are extremely difficult problems. They're very challenging from a technical standpoint and from a, a, a research standpoint. The fact that machine learning is being used pretty much everywhere at Apple, across all different products, uh, but again, the technical difficulty on the problems that we're working on, I think it's, it's, it's will advance, you know, the, the, the field of AI. I, um, uh, so that's, you know, a few things that drew me there. But, but, but really the other thing that I think is, is important is that what we're working on there will end up in, uh, in the products and will be shipped and uh, will impact, you know, millions of, hundreds of millions of users. And that's something that I think is unique to uh, a, a, a company uh, like Apple. Uh, one final thing I, I wanted to just say is I was extremely impressed when I was talking to some of the senior executives at Apple. You know, we had a conversation and imagine you and I, we, we have a conversation and these are very senior folks within the company and, and one of them started asking me about LSTMs. How many of you know what is an LSTM? A few of that, a few of you. It's like a, a recurrent neural network. It's a driving force behind a lot of models for sequential decision making. Imagine this executive is digging into details of, of these very specific models and asking specific mathematical details. I was really, really impressed. And, and, it's, and which executive was it? <laughs> is, 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 is he or she still there? Yes, yes, yes. So that's, that, that, really is, uh, that really is kind of... Uh, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was very impressed. And, that's, uh, and again, just to, to, to summarize, I think that really what drew me there is, is, is the complexity of problems that they're trying to solve. I mean, they try to do something really amazing. And that's, that's what really, and, and, and in, as a matter of fact, I myself a learning, is learning a lot about these kinds of problems and, and, and how we can actually build something that works. 
in academia, you know, we, we publish the papers, we say, well, here's 77% accuracy, we're bidding everybody. Um, at, at a company, you actually have to deliver something that's, you know, 99.999% accuracy, right? And that's, that's very different, uh, which, is, which to me is, is super, super exciting. A good problem, as they say in computing. Thanks, Russ. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you.